This video is intended as a reply to Johnny T689 and his question, how can you not believe in God? Now, I notice that the original video has already attracted a number of low ratings, which I think is unfortunate. Fair enough, the video was made off the cuff and it shows. I'll also consider that he is nowhere near as pretty as me, but who is? And yes, he is arguing from a point of ignorance. But this last item is exactly the point. Surely anyone who calls themselves a secular humanist should applaud another who says, I don't understand. Can you please explain it to me? The question that Johnny T689 has asked has been around for a long time. Historically, there have been three approaches to answering how things came to be. These are, things were made as the chance consequences of the activities of supernatural beings, or things were made intentionally by a supernatural being or beings, or things came to be as a result of natural processes. To illustrate these perspectives, let us consider the rainbow. An example of the first approach are the Australian Aboriginal legends of the rainbow serpent. When we see a rainbow, it is the rainbow serpent arching its body across the sky. The rainbow serpent is unpredictable and associated with water, which accounts for the nature of rainbows. An example of the second approach is the Judeo-Christian God, who created the rainbow as a covenant with man. The rainbow comes out when there is rain nearby as a promise that God will not destroy the earth with flood again. I imagine this would be rather comforting until you realise what he intends the next time. The naturalistic explanation is, of course, that water droplets reflect different frequencies of light at different angles. This neatly explains why the observer always sees rainbows directly opposite the sun. Unlike the other explanation, it also explains why we see similar phenomena in oily paddles and on CDs. Now let's consider the moon. Some Hindus believe that the moon is the cup from which the god drinks Soma. A waxing moon is when the cup is being refilled. The Judeo-Christian tradition has it that the moon was created as a lesser light, set to rule the night. I'm not sure if there's any reason why the crescent moon spends most of its time in the sky during the day. An early natural explanation for the moon came from Anaxagoras in the 5th century BC. He claimed that the moon was a giant spherical rock which reflects the light of the sun. As his explanation did not involve any supernatural beings, he was naturally thrown in prison for his beliefs. The current naturalistic understanding of the moon is imperfect, but the most likely explanation is that the moon was formed by a massive collision between the Earth and another body some four and a half billion years ago. The moons of most other planets appear to have been formed as part of the accretion disks of those planets, and some hold that this is the how the moon was most likely to have formed. At this point you might be saying, nah, science doesn't know, God is a better answer. Well, I disagree for a number of reasons, and these get to the heart of why I don't feel that God is needed in order for the universe to exist. Firstly, science is not about having all the answers already. It is about arriving at the answers after sufficient data is gathered. When we encounter a new disease, we don't give up on science if it doesn't understand how it works immediately. Science has such a good record of tracking down the sources of disease and explaining how they function that few of us ever just say, These people were struck down by God because he was angry. Admittedly, there was one health crisis recently where people used that line, but they are now in the embarrassing position of having to explain why God hates people in the poorest countries in the world. This leads me on to my second point. Where God has been called on to explain the smaller questions of nature, his involvement has since been replaced by natural phenomena. Science eradicated smallpox where thousands of years of prayer failed. The large number of languages in the world turn out not to have required any Tower of Babel, simply separation of people for many centuries. The evolution of languages is an observed fact. Johnny T689 cites the trees, the stars, the sky and the sun. The trees have a good naturalistic explanation, although there remain many questions early on, such as the development of the eukaryotic cell. The stars, of which our sun is one of course, are an inevitable consequence of physics. 
What's more, we can observe stars in all the stages of their life cycles, from stellar nurseries to their death throes, as well as the occasional nova explosion. The sky also has a natural explanation, but I expect I'm missing Johnny's T689's point here. I think his point is, why is there so much beauty? Well, our sense of aesthetics serves useful evolutionary purposes too. That it often misfires is a pleasant side effect. Do I believe it all came from a Big Bang? Well, I know just enough about cosmic background radiation to say that it's a theory that fits the facts. I certainly don't understand all the details, nor do I understand what could have driven the period of inflation. But all these arguments are publicly available and constantly open to scrutiny and public debate until such time as the theory is discredited. Just because we do not have all the answers, there is no reason to go for the quick and easy option of God. Especially when it turns out that he has not been required to answer the simpler questions that he was called upon to answer earlier. I do not absolutely deny the existence of God. I just say that I do not believe that the natural world requires him to exist. I think part of the problem here is understanding the scales involved. The Bible invokes the number 144,000 as unthinkably massive. The numbers that the science throws us are stupefying. The Earth's age is four and a half billion years. Try and conceive of 2,000 years of history. That's 100 generations. Then imagine that 30 times. And that is humanity's history outside of Africa. Our entire recorded history is a fraction of that time. And yet, those 60,000 years is just one seventy thousandth of Earth's age. Then there is distance. A light year is so far we cannot hope to relate it to the scale of our daily lives. Yet the closest galaxy to our own is two and a half million light years away. Some of the galaxies in the Hubble ultra deep field are over 12 billion light years away. The universe has an immense volume. Yes, our very existence is extraordinary, as are our surroundings. But the scale of the universe is so massive that something as extraordinary as our lives become not only possible, but probable. Some would argue inevitable. I hope this helps you to understand my position a little better.